some experience with the Public Knowledge Project. Um, and in this talk, I'm really just going to tell a bit of a kind of personal story about what was going on when I joined PKP in terms of uh, the design and usability stuff, particularly what kind of problems existed, um, and a little bit of history about how we got into those problems, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we went about sort of changing that system and putting in place some things that helped us make some usability gains. Um, so, uh, I joined PKP in April of 2015, um, and I was hired as a software developer, so I wasn't hired in a UX role, I wasn't hired as a designer, um, but I had a background in the WordPress product space, where design and aesthetics are really a key part of selling the product, so I came from a perspective where that was really, really a critical part of the whole process. Um, so in so that was April 2015, and OJS3 had been had just reached out the stage, and this was a complete ground up rebuild of OJS, um, and it was really meant to be a big leap forward in terms of um, bringing the bringing the application up to a kind of modern standard, and um, it had just reached alpha, which means this was kind of the first fully functioning version of it, um, and this is what it looked like. So, uh, it's obvious that no designer was involved in this at any point. No designer was within 100 miles of this. Uh, it's really like a cascade of designers. In this screen, I can actually see four different button styles. So, these are buttons, these are buttons, these are buttons, and those are buttons. So, none of them actually look like each other, and none of them actually look like buttons. <laughs> This is very much how I felt. I think it's how many, many of you felt at different times with different kinds of OJS software. But what I want to talk about is why, or to put it another way, how did we get here? So how did we get to a situation where OJS 3 had gone through a complete ground up rebuild, but no designer had been involved in this project at any point in the process? So there's a few things that I think were at play here. One is PKP and its software really emerged out of the do-it-yourself culture of the early 2000s web. Um, and back then, you know, people really didn't talk about usability. They didn't talk about software being intuitive. Uh, and users didn't really expect that either. You kind of, you know, you got on and you just you, you figured it out one way or the other. Um, it's very different today where, you know, users don't understand it immediately. They, they get upset. Um, but back then, it wasn't really that important. Uh, another big problem is that within the team, which was much smaller then than it is now, um, there's really a lack of understanding of what UX was, what led to UX problems, and particularly what kind of strategies led to resolving UX problems. Um, and then finally, you know, design itself was seen as kind of an unaffordable actually. Like, it'd be nice if we could make this look nice and everything, but we just can't really afford that at all. Um, the most important thing, though, that contributed to this was feature creep. And feature creep is what happens when you say yes to everything. And that's a problem because... I think I just turned it off. There we go. Uh, with feature creep, the more you do, the worse it's going to be. Um, and that's just a basic fact of all software. All software has to anticipate and manage feature creep. Um, and PKP just really struggled to do this. And there's a few reasons that that happened. Um, first of all, come on in. Sorry, okay. um, software for PKP is really a means to an end, and that is to make knowledge public. So from the very beginning, if OJS did not have a feature, and this feature was necessary to migrate <coughs> from a closed publishing system into an open publishing system, then OJS and PKP in particular felt a real responsibility to make that happen, to make it happen as soon as possible. It's not the kind of VC funded startup world where you can build the smallest possible app and then just plow money into customer acquisition. It really mattered to them that the software did what people needed it to do. So that led to pressure for, for new features. Um, the other big thing that happened was early on, PKP became, or OJS became, really a critical part of the publishing infrastructure of the global south. And so, when we think about PKP as, as uh, not just uh, software, but as a, as a mission-driven organization, you know, it was really important to serve, to serve that um, need. And what that meant is that very early on we had 
mass invasive users, and that means we had a whole lot of diverse uh, needs and, and feature requests emerging. <coughs> and then finally, and this is really important, is you know, frankly, PKP didn't have the resources to invest that much in all of these features. So it was able to sustain the product and keep it moving forward, but didn't have the resources to refine it. Um, PKP knew that they had problems with UX. You know, there was a recurring problem, uh, and so in terms of time, I'll just blow past this. But basically, they did a UX review, and the UX review basically says start over. <laughs> the problem with that is, if you're a small team and you just invested a massive amount of time in the rebuild, a UX evaluation that tells you to start over is not helpful. In fact, it actually puts greater barriers on making improvement because all of a sudden it just seems insurmountable. Not only do we not have resources to make iterative improvements, improvements but we definitely don't have resources to just start over again. Um, so, how do we turn things around? Culture, process, resources, uh, I won't create a wrong, I'll just go straight to them. So, um, when I joined the team, you know, I, didn't have, I don't have any like, professional training in design, I don't have any you know, uh, academic training in user experience or anything like that, but because of my background, I, I knew that things were just going off the rails. And so, you know, I came to the team and I just said, look, I, know, I, know, I don't know exactly how you know we get there, but I do know that what we're doing is wrong, and that I can I can do better than this. Um, and so shortly before we hit beta, um, I got the team to let me just do a really quick visual redo of some kind of the, the editorial backend. Um, and this really didn't this really didn't address all of our usability issues. It was really just kind of saying, let's bring at least a basic design. Uh, overhaul to this to, to at least show what can be done. Um, and this was really important for two reasons. One is that I think it overcame a certain inertia within the team that it set in, especially as a result of that UX review where it just felt like doing UX was just impossible, it was this huge hurdle. Um, but, but making this change really demonstrated that actually without an enormous amount of work you can, you can put in place something um, uh, you can actually make a pretty significant improvement. Um, and the other important thing it did was it really established my bona fides within the team. Uh, and that allowed me to start advocating for more and more resources <laughs> to spend time on this kind of stuff. Um, it didn't, however, solve the problem of feature creep. Um, we still had a lot of things coming in. Um, and it, it set up a situation where there's a lot of tension within the team because the team would come and say, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that. And I would say, no, please, please, let's not add another feature. We have enough problems. We're barely holding our heads above the water. Can we please not keep adding more problems to something? Uh, unfortunately, it turned me into a bit of a kind of grumpy gatekeeper. And this, this wasn't really sustainable, mostly because I'm, I'm new, I was new to scholarly publishing. So, I wasn't really the person to be making those decisions about what features are important and what features aren't and how do we balance that need to find what we have and as well as serve the population that we have. Um, so we entered into a process where I felt like I was training the team on what usability in UX was and the team was training me on what scholarly publishing was. Um, and so I tend to think of usability in a fairly straightforward way. The simpler your application is, the easier it is to make it intuitive. The more complex it is, the, the more confusing it's going to be. And usability, UX work, that kind of stuff. Um, you could maybe shift the needle a bit on this, but, but the raw material of what you're working with is going is to involve a certain amount of complexity or simplicity. So when we look at commercial actors, which is the market I came from, not Twitter or Instagram, but just generally consumer-facing products. You know, they're furiously pushing the simplicity in their application. You know, there's a very limited set of things that you can do on Twitter or Facebook uh, or Instagram or whatever. And they, they do that deliberately because they know the simpler that they can make their application, the more intuitive it will be and the, more, the easier it will be for them to onboard new users. But when we talk about scholarly publishing, we're in a very different realm. Scholarly publishing is inherently very, very complex. And that means that scholarly publishing and the, the application that you build for it are by their nature going to be a lot more confusing. And scholarly publishing is getting even more complex than it is now. So as well as all the stuff we've been dealing with for years, like DOIs, URNs, depositing places, 
we've got new schemas coming up like credit, we have new problems we're trying to solve like how do we manage research software, how do we credit research software, how do we manage all these different kinds of review processes that people want to explore, all this kind of stuff. So, not only is Kali publishing complex, but it's getting much more complex. And from a product or service design perspective, this is very much moving in the wrong direction. So, for me, my perspective is, let's move up and to the left. But much of the scholarly publishing community is busy kind of moving things down and to the right. <laughs> Push the wrong button. Yep. So this is very much how I felt for the last four years. <laughs> and again, it created this tension and it wasn't very productive. I mean, we were in this process of shifting the culture from a yes culture to a no first culture. Um, and that's, that's been really important, but at the end of the day, it's not enough just to say no to everything. We have to figure out how to manage this stuff. Um, and so for that, we, we needed to institute process. And we didn't go about, like a, a, we didn't move forward with a clear plan about this is exactly the steps we're gonna take. Uh, but we started out with one thing here, one thing there. And we ended up with what seems like a pretty good process for us. And it started with user testing. Um, and I won't play the video, uh, but uh, I will share the slides after. And if you want to see it, it's a video of some of the live user testing that Sonia Betts uh, ran for us. Um, the user testing was really important in kind of shifting, uh, instead of just hearing from other people, oh, we want this, or we want that, or whatever, we're actually going out and testing things that we already did things that the platform, features that the platform already had, and we were looking at what was already confusing and not very uh, user-friendly, uh, and that allowed us to kind of start thinking about priorities. Uh, so we would take all of the notes that we gathered from this user testing, and we would dump it into a big spreadsheet, and we'd assign priorities. You know, the top one, which thankfully we don't have any now, uh, was critical, and what that meant was this is either broken or it's so confusing that people aren't even able to use it. So this is actually quite common. We had lots of features in the system that we spent a lot of time and money building, but no one could actually use them because they were so confusing. Um, so we just had everything kind of ranked um, uh, from sort of most critical to, to lowest priority stuff. And this allowed us to start negotiating in terms of how resources were, um, how like new development work was being parceled out, but where resources were going. And there were kind of three questions that we would ask. Um, I mean, I say that like we had a really formal process, and it wasn't. It was mostly me asking these questions at first. Um, and it was really, so if someone comes to us with a new feature, I want to ask the question, is this new feature actually more critical than some kind of UX priority we have? And when I talk about critical, what I mean is, are there people who actually cannot publish with our platform because this feature is missing? Um, because we did have UX priorities that are actually preventing people from using the platform. I mean, there's probably people in this room who have sat down with OJS and unsuccessfully tried to publish something. I know when I joined the team, I spent about a week trying to figure out how to publish a submission. And I couldn't actually get, I had to ask somebody. Um, so the second question is, who's actually going to benefit from this new feature? You know, oftentimes we hear a lot about new feature requests because that three to five percent who really need that feature, they're the vocal ones. They're they're up on the forums. They're letting us know. But what we don't hear from people is, I do this thing every day, like assigning a reviewer, and it's really annoying that I have to do this sort of thing. So the user testing and the priorities we set there really gave us uh, a way to kind of evaluate how many people are going to use this new feature versus if we invested time in you know, saving people time during the regular workflow, how many people are going to benefit from that? Um, and then the last question, which is the hardest one to ask and to answer, um, but really involved kind of uh, this culture change within the organization, is thinking of features as having an inherently negative impact on the software. So again, when we think about that simplicity, complexity, access, every new thing that we provide is going to be a tax or like a burden on everyone who doesn't use that feature. Um, so when we're thinking about what features go into core and stuff, we actually need to evaluate not just who's going to use it, but 
who's not going to use it, and how is this going to impact them? So, um, yeah, it's a completely different environment today, thankfully. Um, you know, once we had this process, we were able to kind of see iterative gains in the usability stuff, and that's helped make the argument for devoting more resources within the team to this stuff. So, today we've got Israel, who you'll hear from next, uh, who is going to be coordinating UX research and evaluation stuff. Um, the community is heavily involved in the user testing, both running the testing as well as participating in it, as well as this prioritization thing, which is really important. Um, community partners have really helped us identify you know, not just like what are the 20 things you want from OJS, but if you can only have one or two, what are those one or two things you want us to work on first? And that's been really important. And, and I have to say the community has been really good about that. It's, it's hard to be told we're not going to do something that you want us to do. Um, but the community has been really understanding about us figuring out our priorities and then making sure that we're focusing on them. What we don't do very well is actually communicating those priorities back to the team, but we can work on that. Um, and today we've got like about a half a dozen pe people involved in the research, design, implementation, and iteration of UX. And that's a, that's a huge improvement, because when we started it was really just me doing stuff. Um, but you know, thinking back to Tara's talk yesterday, it's really important that we have more voices involved in this process, and it isn't just me kind of desperately trying to hack things together. And most of those half a dozen are in this room today, actually. Um, and then the biggest thing uh, is um, that now, nowadays, when we're, when we're thinking about new features and things, um, design and UX uh, perspective is actually involved early on in that process. So it used to be that features would sort of arrive and then we desperately try and make them usable in some way. Um, but nowadays, we're actually there with features being with what happens, and we can say, oh, you know, maybe let's not implement the feature this way, let's implement it another way, it'll be more intuitive. Uh, and that's, that's been a really important part of the process. Um, I'll go ahead and skip this slide for, for time, but um, I just want to say if you're in an institution that maybe doesn't value UX or doesn't feel it has the resources to do UX, um, I think one of the things you can learn from us is to start small and, and create kind of some kind of proven impact, and that will give you leverage to start actually um, negotiating for resources to, to do this sort of stuff. So that's me.